The antediluvian epoch ended with the flood, and it ended suddenly. It says in Scripture, on the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up over the entire planet of the uh, planet Earth. What's associated with the flood event is a series of events of unbelievable power. Superquakes, for example, much bigger than modern quakes. For example, at the beginning of the flood, we think this uh, breakup of the fountains of the great deep involved an earthquake that lasted for about four to five hours of time, rather than usual earthquakes lasting only a few seconds, maybe 20 seconds for the big ones. This one would have required that much time to crack the earth, hours to crack the earth uh, the duration and collapsing the edges of the continents in the process. This uh, flood seems to have eroded thousands of feet off the surface of the continents, thousands of feet of sediment, critters and plants and sediment and rocks uh, taken off the so on top of continents and then uh, ultimately dumped later on top of the continents again. Crustal plates moved horizontally across the surface of the earth at meters per second in the course of a single year trans uh, crossing hundreds of miles of distance. Those continents would collide with each other with enough force to actually raise mountains tens of thousands of feet into the air. It's during this period of time that the continents smash together to form the great supercontinent called Pangaea. But this supercontinent was formed during the flood covered with water. It was a supercontinent that was never above water. Uh, the sinking of the ocean crust during this period 70% of the Earth's surface, the rocks on the Earth's surface, sank directly into the, uh, towards the center of the Earth, landing ultimately at the bottom of the mantle, thousands of kilometers beneath the surface. The separation of plates, as some plates were falling into the center of the Earth, we have plates that are moving apart. Hot material from the mantle is coming up, contacting ocean water, uh, vaporizing ocean water, and, and catapulting it hyperballistically up into the atmosphere thousands of miles. This is along a 50,000 mile line around the Earth several times, creating hyper geysers, geysers that are miles high, and creating new seafloor, new, a new rock at the bottom of the floor, and heating up the oceans of the flood, a total of about 20 degrees centigrade in the course of the flood. As this happened, uh, the ocean floor lower before the flood because the rocks were cool, now higher uh, during the flood as the uh, hot molten uh, material came in to replace it, displaced water from the oceans onto and over the continents, covering all the high hills under the whole heaven, killing all of the organisms of the, of the land in the process except those that were preserved in the ark. The sediment that was ripped off the top of the continents, uh, thousands of feet of sediment, is carried across the world probably several times over the world and then ultimately buried on top of the continents. Thousands of feet of sediment draped across entire continents, hundreds of each layer hundreds of feet thick, uh, thousands of feet above current sea level, uh, sourced thousands of miles away. Uh, laid down by east to west currents across the continent. Uh, all of these processes, none of these processes are anything like the processes that are going on today. The process, in the process, we've, uh, God has done this, has created this mechanism to destroy all humans and land animals on the surface of the earth, except those on the ark itself. It buried then in the process, those sediments that are laid across the continents, billions upon billions of organisms. The organisms of the shallow ocean before the flood, the organisms of the land, the organisms that, that, uh, that flied or tr flew above the surface, that tried to fly above the surface during the flood, eventually all of those are taken up by the flood. It probably first of all took the marine organisms and buried them and then moved on to the land, burying the land ecosystems one at a time. During this same period of time, we've got evidence of meteorite impacts on the earth. A very large number of meteorite impacts are occurring during this year-long flood. 
We see the same sort of effects on the moon. The earth and the moon are being pelted with meteoritic impacts, uh, a very large number in a very short period of time, which suggests that the flood is even bigger than the earth itself. Some, where these meteorites are coming from is somewhere outside the earth-moon system. Uh, that suggests that perhaps the entire solar system and, uh, is involved which seems to be confirmed by the fact that Venus's surface rocks have been uh, relatively recently overturned. They seem to date the overturn of those rocks at about the same time that the Earth was hit by this global flood. So it could be that Venus experienced a, a catastrophe at the same time the Earth did, which rather than sinking 70% of the surface of the planet, which is the case on the Earth, it actually sank 100% of the surface of Venus, an even bigger catastrophe for Venus. On Mars, there's evidence that uh, at least 10 to 15% of the surface was resurfaced at, this, at about this same time, which again confirms the fact that uh, this event seems to be bigger than the, than the Earth alone. It was cosmic. It may, in fact, have included the entire universe, which would make sense because the flood was a judgment upon human sin, and humans were created to be the kings over the entire creation, not just the plants and the animals and the earth itself, but the entire creation. So when man sinned and had to be judged, the entire creation is impacted. What follows the flood is what I call the Arphaxadian Epoch. Arphaxad was born, according to the Bible, two years after the flood. He lives for 400 years. So the period of centuries following the flood is a period of the earth recovering from the effects of the flood. And that world was a radically new world, quite unlike the world that came before. Continents had been rearranged. Some continents are probably gone from the pre-flood world. The land is completely resurfaced with thousands of feet taken off the previous continents and thousands of feet of sediment put on these new continents. There would be new places for, there's nothing probably uh, that you can recognize from the pre-flood world. Mountains are all different, the rivers are different, the plains are different, the coastlines are different. Everything is new on this world. The ocean is warmer, it's 20 degrees or 68 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was before. This would generate a lot of precipitation, a lot more than the present, creating a lot of precipitation over the land uh, and creating a wet climate over the entire surface of the earth. So probably for a time, we're talking about a tropical climate everywhere across all of the continents of the earth, regardless of latitude. Now life had been completely decimated. On, and when we're talking about land animals, uh, the only thing left of each of the land Brahmins were two individuals, or seven, that were on the ark. They're, the original diversity, which may have been hundreds and even thousands of species within created kinds, is now reduced to maybe one species. And so we have to recover all of this original diversity very quickly. Uh, the life is also geographically uh, very, uh, very sequestered. The land animals in particular, the only place they exist is where the ark landed. When the ark landed and the people and the animals got out, that's the only place the land animals existed. They're going to have to recover. They're going to have to spread out from the ark. Probably only a few thousand uh, individual animals and Brahmins, or created kinds, are represented, and they're sitting there in the uh, Ararat Mountains of the Middle East. The recovery from the flood would have been a long process, taking centuries. It would be difficult on everyone and everything involved. But the recovery was probably a waning process. Uh, the recovery was probably very rapid at first and decreases uh, as time goes on. So at the end of the flood, you've got a very wet earth. The earth is covered with water. It's going to dry slowly with time. The um, flood involved probably the most powerful earthquakes in earth history. Following the flood, those earthquakes are going to decrease in power and, fre and frequency following the flood. The um, 
storms, the earth, it's the, the flood itself was probably the, the most incredible storm in earth history. And what we find following the flood is a waning of the intensity of storms following the flood. So we've got geology going on here. Uh, the, we've got volcanoes, we've got uh, earthquakes that are very catastrophic, very powerful, many times modern uh, power and intensity fo uh, immediately following the flood and then slowing down during the Arfaxadian epoch to the modern levels. In fact, you would, it would be fair to say that modern geology, geologic process, modern volcanoes, modern earthquakes are really still the leftover remnants of the flood. They're still slowing down in frequency. They're still waning in power, but we're still in, technically, the geology of the flood since it's only about 4,500 years ago. Horizontal tectonic stop, this motion of continents that are moving very quickly across the surface of the earth during the flood, it slows down and stops in this Arfaxadian epoch. Uh, as things cool down and reshuffle, it might uh, actually move a little bit following this. In the present, we have tiny motions, very slow motions of continents that probably is, again, a leftover remnant of the uh, pre-flood uh, pre conditions. We then have the institution of a different type of geology. Right? Most of the geology, geologic activity that's going on during the flood is the motion of continents horizontally. Following the flood, we now have the adjustment, the vertical adjustment of the land. Places that a whole bunch of stuff has been dumped on top of that wasn't there before are going to sink down because of the weight of the material. Places that have been eroded with less material than was there before are going to rise upward to isostatically rebound from the, uh, to, to the condition that they really want to be. Kind of like uh, a bunch of ice cubes thrown into water. If you push the ice, an ice cube down here and let it go, it's going to bob upward by isostatic uh, equilibrium, isostatic rebound. And so land that was pushed down during the flood or was er eroded during the flood is going to rebound upward. Land that was piled up with too much stuff, like the formation of mountains, will, uh, will drop during the post-flood period, the Arfax Adian Epoch. And so you've got, since this event was only 4,500 years ago, and the surface of the earth, the upper layers of the earth are, are so viscous, they don't move very quickly, uh, there's still motion, even 4,500 years later, from the flood itself. So whereas this motion probably will equilibrate in 20 or 30,000 years, it hasn't been that long since the flood. So there's still places on the earth where things are moving up and down, unexplained in the conventional dating of things, like the Appalachian Mountains shouldn't be moving. They are 300 million years old, according to conventional dating. But if they were formed during the flood, which I believe they were, they are only 4,500 years old. That would explain why the Appalachian Mountains are experiencing earthquakes in this rebound fashion. They shouldn't be if they're old. They are because they were actually formed during the flood. Climatologically, the warm oceans produce that heavy rainfall over all of the continents. This would produce probably something very much like a tropical rainforest over most of the world. Uh, it also has a lot of rainfall, so you're going to do a lot of erosion during this period, creating uh, thick sedimentary units that are formed over vast areas, and we see some examples of that. It's also going to fill up areas in the middle of the continents with water, uh, creating vast lakes uh, on the continents, what we call pluvial lakes. We see that uh, there's evidence of lakes that, that uh, backed up above what is now the Grand Canyon, lakes that uh, reached up into Wyoming even from there. Uh, these lakes would fill up with water, overtop their dams, break out their dams, catastrophically cut out their dams, producing canyons such as the Grand Canyon and other canyons of similar nature uh, during this period of time. 
the evaporation that produced the heavy rainfall on the continents is going to cool the oceans during this period, which is consistent with what evidence we have, we have evidence from the shells of uh, sea creatures that the oceans cool during this period following the flood. Uh, the continents cool, the continents always also begin to dry off. So you get a North America, for example, a transition from forests across the entire continent to gradually the development of grasslands in the center of the continent. And organisms are changing at the same time and adapting to that and actually uh, changing to be able to eat the grass of the gra grasslands. At the same time, while the oceans are cooling, eventually the precipitation falls in some places, the tops of mountains and certain uh, colder regions of the earth, in the form of snow. It's coming down so fast that it can't melt during the, during the, uh, uh, the summer periods of time, and so it accumulates into great ice sheets over uh, the Hudson Bay and eastern North America region like that, and in the mountains, and in Antarctica producing very thick ice sheets, miles thick. And then finally, there's a point at which the oceans cool so much that there's no longer uh, a lot of precipitation, especially over the uh, cold glaciers, and the glaciers stop accumulating. At this point, the, thick, the ice is so thick that the ice actually collapses under its own weight, surges outward, spreads across the continents around it, producing continental glaciation, which in North America reaches down into uh, what is now the United States all the way to the Ohio River and the Missouri River in the south, then quickly melts back uh, because it's reaching down too far into too warm an area, but it's melting a lot of ice very rapidly, producing a huge amount of water that produces another set of canyons and lakes uh, and eroding uh, 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 beautiful canyons uh, as a consequence. During all this period of time, while all this is happening geologically and climatologically, organisms are spreading out from the, uh, from the ark and they're recovering the diversity that existed within Brahmins through intrabaraminic diversification. Now God is the one that chose the organisms that got onto the ark so he knows good and well what the earth is going to be like after the flood. So he's going to choose organisms probably that are well suited for that warm, wet climate that follows the flood. And he's going to choose organisms that can quickly multiply, move out from the tower, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the region of the, of the ark, and fill the earth uh, as they were supposed to. Uh, this had to, be happen had to happen rapidly because God wants us to see His nature in those things that are made. So I believe He has designed into organisms this diversification to occur very rapidly in the matter of just a few centuries. So while geology is recovering, biology is able to recover in the same period of time. God commands the organisms to reproduce, multiply, and fill the earth, and that is exactly what they do. In certain Brahmins, in some Brahmins, the number of species increases a hundredfold. In other uh, Brahmins, it increases thousandfold. In others, even ten thousandfold. Uh, during the height of this period of time, there are probably new species uh, uh, appearing on the earth on an hourly basis. It is happening very rapidly. But it's not happening by the conventional method of evolution. It's happening by revealing genetic information along uh, pre-programmed genetic paths. And this explains such things as intraspecific intra hybrids, uh, vestigial organs, uh, genetic throwbacks, breeds, stratomorphic intermediates, uh, trajectories, and so on and so forth that we've talked about earlier in the course. Uh, during this period of time, because it's warm oceans and cold continents, uh, an organism can actually move around the world wherever it wanted to go in its temperature, desired temperature regime by following the continental edges. At the same time, you can also cross oceans during this time on, I believe, vegetation rafts. During the flood, 
the world's forests were overcome by the, by the flood. Many of those trees were in fact buried or destroyed in the course of the flood, but probably billions upon billions of trees in fact floated through the flood and would float for decades and centuries following the flood. So as the wind of the post-flood world, uh, which would be probably quite substantial given the temperature differences in the world, the wind of the post-flood world would actually uh, create currents in the oceans which would move these great huge rafts of vegetation around the oceans. So animals could actually get on these rafts, cross the oceans, get off the rafts on the other side, and thus move very effectively to all of the continents of the world. For humans, again, it's a wild world. It's one that's completely unfamiliar to them. Nothing looks the same as it did before the flood. Uh, but we're told in the Bible that all modern humans are descendant from Noah. And we can see the evidence of this in the fact that there's uh, mitochondrial DNA suggests that there is a common ancestor not very long ago. Why chromosome data also that humans have a common ancestor not long ago in terms of thousands of years. Now, unlike the animals that were commanded to uh, disperse across the earth and fill the earth, humans didn't obey God's command. They stayed in one place, in the place they called Babel, and uh, they built a city and began building a tower. Uh, these, these people did not, uh, so, so during the period that they're staying in that place, not probably not far from where the ark landed, animals are getting to all places in the world. So we've got the evidence of fossils of animals in the post-flood world in the Arfaxadian epoch that are getting to every continent of the world and humans still aren't seen yet. It is not until this Babel event when God decides to uh, split up the languages of the people that humans then disperse from uh, Babel at this point. That's when I think we find the first human fossils. When we find the first human fossils, they're uh, spread across the old world from Spain to South uh, Africa to uh, China. Uh, they then at this point are spreading across the continents as they were supposed to do in the first place. Uh, it's also at Babel where he, God creates the basic language groups, probably something on the order of uh, several score languages at this point. That would explain the major language groups that we have on the present world. Uh, it's also during this period when people separate with their distinct languages that they created their own uh, written language in various, uh, various locations, which would explain why uh, human writing, the language written down in different places, is so radically different because in fact it's produced by groups of people that ha had nothing to do with each other uh, once they left Babel. Also, it would explain each of these people developed their own music, architecture, uh, culture. There's distinct differences in all of those things in these major groups of people. Uh, I think we can explain much of the diversity of culture uh, through this particular event. Uh, I suspect that once these, or, uh, once these individuals spread out from Babel and remain distinct from each other and not communicating with each other because they couldn't communicate because of their language problem, each of these units was probably very small in size, only a few humans in each family unit. In such a small unit, uh, there is something called genetic drift which would operate under those circumstances, and just the process of randomness, uh, certain traits would be fixed in such populations, which means that just uh, the process of uh, people dying and just the weird uh, random processes that might happen, a particular trait will come to be found in every member of that population. That particular family unit would get a particular skin color, for example, just by a random sequence of events. Another one would get another skin color. Another one would get a uh, particular body shape that would be uh, uh, then inherited or passed on to the next generation and in fact create an entire culture with those particular characteristics. In that unfamiliar world, 
a world that looked so much unlike the world that came before, these humans would improvise. They would do the best they could at living where they could, where they could live. It probably explains why so many of them are dwelling in caves. It's why they uh, first pick up rocks and, and uh, fashion the rocks into tools. But I believe very quickly in the course of a single lifetime, they would actually work their way through some increased sophistication until they're working with metals once they found the metals, uh, which they're not going to get right away. They're gonna, it's going to take them a while to find those things and to, uh, uh, to then mine those metals and produce other types of tools. It's, uh, it's during this period in just the matter of, again, people are living for centuries, in just the matter of decades, humans, I believe, are working their way through uh, the entire evolution of culture that we see in the record. So this was a very quick run through the history of life uh, to, to get kind of the 30,000 foot high uh, view of what happened on the history uh, on the earth uh, to organisms through time. Both the history of humans and the history of animals is highly tied to each other throughout history. It's also giving us insight into how God has interacted with humans through time.